but for people watching us, I'm talking to Tara Brack, psychologist, um, teacher, meditation teacher, and author of uh, a wonderful book called Radical Acceptance, which is, I think, one of the best uh, titles, book titles ever. And, of course, your uh, most recent book, which I have here. I'm not sure if people see it because I'm not sure if I'm in the video, but it's called True Refuge. And it has been translated into Dutch. Congratulations with that. And do you know what it's called in Dutch, Tara? Oh, please tell me. It's called Je Hart als Geldplaats. Hmm. Do you want to try that? <laughs> if it fit by bed, I will. <laughs> Je Hart. Je Hart. Als Geldplaats. Uh, a cell pass. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So, I again, can tell it sounded different. <laughs> yeah. So, again, congratulations with that. We're very happy with that. And you're coming to Holland. Yeah, I'm Yay. excited. Yeah. Yes, we are very thrilled. It's uh, September 14. Uh, I believe you're coming. That's um, right. So, I'm one of the many people who know you mostly through your uh, podcast. Um, your amazing, funny, fresh, weekly, wise um, um, kind of uh, sermon, it feels to me. I know a couple of people who listen to you weekly, and for example, one of my friends, Joyce, she, she always listens to your talk on Sunday, and we, and she also always says it's 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 a little bit like going to church. <laughs> so. Um, and and it's kind of the same for me. I've been listening to your to your podcast for years now, and I I kind of grew up on it. Um, mm. I've been listening since I think my mid twenties, and you have been so influential uh, in my life, really, um, mm. and uh, such a uh, voice of kindness and wisdom and um, support, and also sangha, really. Um, mm. So I also want to take this amazing mm. opportunity to kind of officially thank you oh. for, for, for all of this. And it, yeah, it's, um, it's, I'm, I'm very uh, thrilled to um, say this to you personally, and I hope we meet in uh, Holland. And it must be amazing for you to have, I mean, there are so many of us who, are, who feel like we have this relationship with you, who are, you know, you're in our car, you're in our homes, you're in our mind it must be um, uh, amazing to 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 know that in a way that you're it's very sweet to feel a sense of kind of global community of it's people that are listening to me but also people that are more and more um, just feeling dedicated to waking up their hearts and minds it it's it's so inspiring to me yeah, mm, yeah. Yeah, it, it is, and and yay for technology for making this, yeah, yeah. For making this possible. It's amazing. So, uh, you know, aside, I think you're also your. I, I I also really admire your podcast because they are kind of this little artwork. Each week is so it's so beautiful also to listen to, and I always have this feeling of it's kind of taking this trip. <laughs> it's like I take a little trip with with you, and I often listen with my girlfriend, and often we are in the car, and it. You kind of bring us from, you know, from A to Z in, a, in mm -hmm. quite a literal way. And um, one thing I admire a lot from your talks and your work is the way how you kind of merge your experience as a therapist with mm -hmm. uh, your uh, insights and ex well, so experience in, in Buddhist tradition, in Dharma. And the way you not only merge it, but then come up with um, metaphors that are so, I think, uh, in tune with these times and so appropriate and so fresh um, and really helpful. So, I mean, I can name a lot of them, but one of them I think that is also interesting, um, well, is always interesting, but really touched me and also I see people uh, resonate with a lot, is your, um, your idea of trance. Mm. Yeah. And unreal other. So I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit on on this subject, this term of trance and how, we, how, how that works for us. Sure, sure. Well, you know, there's a, a palliative caregiver that describes how the greatest regret of the dying is 
I didn't live true to myself. In some way, I lived according to the expectations of others or my own internalized messages and shoulds, but I didn't really live true to my heart. And I think as we begin to pay attention, we realize we spend a lot of our moments kind of on automatic, where we're you know, doing the same habitual behaviors and we're having the same thoughts we had yesterday and the day before and the same patterns of reactions. And that's what I call a trance. It's where, we're, where our mind is in some way contracted and we're in our wants and our fears, but we're forgetting um, the larger world. We're forgetting what we really love. We're forgetting that we are loved. We're forgetting beauty. Um, so we get, we get small-minded, and then we live in ways that don't represent all of who we are. So in a way, I think of the spiritual path as one of remembering, of saying, oh, it's like I was just in a dream. You know, I was lost in all those thoughts about judging that person, or I was lost in all those thoughts about being worried about what's around the corner, and I'm forgetting the life that's here. And, and so there's all these different levels of waking up, but trance is a good way of kind of reminding ourselves we really fall asleep. Yes, yeah, and I also, what would also, the, the term, what it also does to me is kind of, it has this kind of yucky feeling to it. Mm hmm, mm hmm, yeah. Um, you know, it's like, I don't want to be in a trance. Yeah. And um, whereas, I don't know, different ways of approaching that could be actually pretty attractive, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of interesting to be, lo be, be lost, you know, to, be lo to feel lost in a way in something, you know, it can be, can have it's kind of a glamorous feeling, but being in a trance is, is just kind of, kind of makes me feel like be, being, in a, being a zombie, and it just yes. feels that way, right? And Zombie's the word that came to my mind, too. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's there's a kind of dullness and narrowness and habituation where you don't feel creative or spontaneous or fresh. You know, you're, we're missing out on feeling intimate with our life. Yeah. And I use the word intimate a lot on purpose because when we're really feeling at home and free, you know, when we're really feeling good, there's a quality of intimacy, like we really feel close to whoever we're with, or close to our own heart, or close to the nature around us, and we lose all that. When we're in trance, it's kind of like a glazed, you know, we're just not living from that wholeness. And the term unreal other is a product of trance, and what it means is that the other person, instead of being a real, subjective, sentient being, has is actually just a part of our, our movie. It's like we're the, the star of our movie, the protagonist, mm -hmm. and everybody else is kind of a, a, a player in the field, and either they're there because there's something we want from them, or they're there because there's something we're afraid of, and we're, you know, we're trying to defend, or else they don't have a major role, and in which case we're not interested. But we lose sight of the authenticity of other beings. And when we don't realize others are real, that they suffer just the way we suffer, the same fears, the same shame, the same longings, you know, when we forget that, we can hurt them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's you can hurt people that you don't feel are real. Sure. And um, and to me, this it's a big conflict between, I think there's this, this huge longing of wanting to be intimate, like you say, with, with people around us and seeing them as real as we know they are. And at the same time, it's such a challenge um, uh, to take, to actually, well, the, the consequence of regarding other people as real people is so huge in a world where we are constantly confronted with so much suffering, basically. I mean, I, you must have known about the uh, plane crash, you know, with a lot of Dutch people dying, and also, you know, all the things that are going on in the in the Gaza right now. It's also such a, I mean, such a challenge to to see all these people as real people. It's like, how will we function? Yeah. Um, uh, and at the same time, it's so clear that all this suffering is a product of 
you know, all the parties not seeing each other as real people. Um, so how would you? Yeah. How I know you. I know you. I love what you say about the, doing the news. What you call a newspaper practice. Yeah, yeah. So may, maybe you have some kind of advice on how to keep, you know, f feeling other people's as real and not kind of c collapsing. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, the whole, the only way we can really be compassionate is if we let ourselves be touched by others' suffering. I mean, otherwise it's an abstraction. If I say I want to be compassionate towards what's going on for you, if I don't really let myself, you know, feel, really feel like in an embodied way, oh, okay, you're scared or you're disappointed or you're hurting, my compassion will just be mental. Yeah. So people, when I talk about the alchemy of compassion, they'll say, yeah, but I'm so thin-skinned. As soon as I start trying to take in what's going on, it's like I get overwhelmed and flooded. And if we think of ourselves as a separate self, an egoic self, then trying to take in the suffering of others will feel like we're getting flooded. But if we start sensing that we can let things move in and through us and just offer them into the universe, it's like be touched but then don't hold it, just let it move through. Mm. We, we become kind of a flow through, but we become sensitive but not overcooked, you know. So um, it seems to me that if we don't pay attention to others as real others, um, we won't respond and act in a way that can help heal our earth. But we need to be skillful in how we take in. And sometimes we need to turn our attention other somewhere else. Sometimes we need to go for a walk somewhere beautiful and just remember there's beauty too, you know. Or sometimes you need, when, we're, when things are really hard in the world, we need to have somebody just, you know, hug us or laugh with us or have a cup of tea with us. So it's not like we need to just mainline on suffering. But unless we are opening to the joys and the sorrows, we're not going to be living fully, and we won't respond. This world needs us to respond. We won't respond. Thank you. So yeah. I love what you say about compassion. You know, having to having to be like embodied. Yeah. And I think this is such a big, also a big theme in your uh, approach to well, your work and the Dharma is just embodiment. And I've been hearing you talk a lot recently about felt sense. Yeah. And yeah. I'm super fascinated by it. Could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by, by this yeah. of felt sense and its importance? And yeah. You know, we, if we don't feel things in our body, we're living in a mental trance. I mean, when we're living in our thoughts, we have to have thoughts that they help us survive and thrive. But if we don't inhabit our bodies, we actually can't feel love. You know, love is a felt sense. And we can't feel compassion and we can't feel joy. So we need to enter our body. And I found that the languaging of felt sense, and I... And I'd say the source of it is from this uh, psychotherapy called focusing, which is uh, Eugene Genlin was the first that I've heard use the term. But the, the notion of felt sense is that it's experienced in an embodied way as an experience of whatever is going on is felt through the body and that we're sensing it through the body. So it's as if you're bringing your whole awareness into your body and saying, okay, what's this experience like? in my physical being and it brings things alive our body becomes such a instrument of intelligence when we listen in it's the instrument that lets us that helps us to feel compassion when there's sorrow it's an instrument that when we see goodness if i if i take you in now as we're talking and and really um sense your sincerity and your beauty outer and inner and really appreciate it, then there's this warm tenderness that comes through the body. So even as I'm saying it, I can feel a connection that grows, which I'm appreciating right now. Yeah. I and you feel, it, yeah. <laughs> you feel 
Because then as you let that in, because you're letting it in, you're, you're feeling the response. So all of a sudden we have a resonance field that's actually real. Not, we're not living as these separate entities in an abstraction. So it's very powerful to come into the body. And it's the only way we can heal the wounds also. In other words, if psychotherapy doesn't go into the body and feel where the wounds are in an embodied way, they don't untangle. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's wonderful. And um, to me, as we were talking and feeling this, I was like, and how, how, can, how, how did we miss it? Now, how can we miss it? Mm-hmm. You know, for so long, how we can, how can we, how did we actually manage to kind of skip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, our, uh, all this, what you say, this intelligence of our, of our body—it's so close. It's like it's too close. Or that's and that's exactly almost the response, which is you know when we're young, if life feels like too much, we leave our bodies, and if we. If we grew up in a culture or if our caregivers um, weren't able to really sense who we were, our caregivers weren't able to respond to our needs, uh, life became unsafe. And when there's fear and when there's woundedness and when there's a feeling of something's wrong with me, those raw feelings can be too much. And so the first defense we have against too much is to leave our bodies. And... Most of us have left some, you know, most of us spend a certain amount of time where it's not that we need to be thinking, but we really don't want to be feeling the life that's here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. And I think it's also beautiful that you um, emphasize this so much in your approach to meditation and the the Dharma, because I, um, I started doing yoga before I started sitting. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of, I've, I connected more in a way to the sitting practice, but I've always missed yeah. um, kind of the real strong connection to the body. And of course, this is different in different traditions and different teachers, but I so applaud teachers who bring in the body really in the sitting practice, not just as a kind of uh, setting up, you know, setting up the posture and then kind of, you know, disconnecting yeah. from it. Yeah. Um, which reminds me to say hi from Jill Satterfield to you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. Let's give her my love. Sure, yeah. I will. I will. And I, to me, she is also one of the teachers who is really doing such a wonderful work in, in you know, reconnecting, basically. Oh, she brings together the um, mindful awareness in the body beautifully. Yeah. Amazingly. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, so thank you. And so my last question is just kind of out of curiosity, what is on your mind right now? Like what is something, a subject or a theme or that, you know, you're working on or mm-hmm. are you fascinated by or, you know, yeah. whatever you'd like to. Sure. Well, I just gave two talks on, on the theme of our basic goodness and how, you know, we grow up in a culture and with parents that often has us mistrust ourselves that in some deep way we assume something's wrong, that, you know, in some way we're falling short, we're not okay, we're not enough. And and if we're not assuming something's wrong with us, we're um, in some way judging others. And there's a tremendous amount of, of pain and um, we lose out on our life moments when we're at war with ourselves. And so I just did two talks in a row on how we can begin to trust this essential goodness that that the one that we're looking at that coming through their eyes is the same consciousness and the same longings and the same aspiration to be real and honest and that that's our deepest longing to love and be true and um, how to trust ourselves so I'm I'm finding more and more that um, the key shift in a in a person's unfolding spiritually is when there comes that moment of true um, compassion towards one's inner life and then he, and then underneath that a sense of really trusting that I am not the story or the narrative 
of that separate deficient self. That's not who I am. That the who I am is mysterious and vast and loving and intrinsically good. And so that, that theme is very much on my mind because I, I feel like if we could move through the world trusting that goodness and seeing that goodness in each other, it would be, it would ripple out to bring tremendous amount of peace and healing to our world. That's yeah. yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, and that's, I'll be spending some time on that theme when I'm in Amsterdam, so, and I'm really looking forward to being, that's great. In, I'm so excited to come visit, yeah. Good, is this your first time in, in Holland? Um, yes. I, uh, yes, it's the first time I, as an adult, I think I was there when I was much younger, but yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, yeah. we are very much looking forward to welcoming you, September 14th. Yeah. We'll have, uh, probably underneath this video, we'll have all the information for people to go to your website, find out more about you and your work, and also to find out about the event. Uh, so, for now, thank you so much, Tara, for uh, taking the time to talk to me and share uh, you know, your thoughts. And again, um, see you in Holland. Yeah, thank you, so, dear. Thank Blessings. you. Yeah. Mm. Namaste. So. Namaste. So this is.